Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the house of the Lord. It's good to see at least all of you made it with the time change. The good news is the clock at the back says 930. That means I get an extra hour to preach, right? Just kidding. Um, but uh, it's good to have everybody here this morning. And uh, it's good to see everybody alive and well. You know, I, I just love it when I hear the kids crying and people talking and everything. Because you know what that just means? It just means we're all alive. It's great. It's good to see life. So, and even one of them's waving from the back. Okay, awesome. Well, I trust they're doing well. And uh, it's good to know that when this world shakes, we have an anchor in Jesus Christ. And one of the things about the relationship in Christ that anchors us when the world is shaking is singing. Singing helps to focus our hearts. Doesn't matter if you're good at it or not. It focuses our hearts. It draws us to the heart of God. It brings us to worship. And when we sing, we're actually obeying the commands of Scripture to do that. And it anchors us in the Word of God because so much of what we sing is derived from the Word of God. It encourages each other. Man, uh, when I'm in a huge group of people singing together, it's encouraging, isn't it? When you hear other people shouting out the same things that we're feeling, it's good. And we're doing spiritual battle when we sing. We're not just singing nice tunes because they're nice and they're fun. We're actually doing battle when we sing to the Lord. It strengthens us and it glorifies God and we get joy in the process. So there's a whole lot of reasons why we sing. Colossians 3, Paul encourages us, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So that's what we're going to do. So let's stand together and sing out with all your hearts as Haram comes to lead us. Amen. Why don't you just greet somebody in the name of the Lord before you sit down? Try to find somebody you haven't met before or haven't talked to for a while. Thanks for a good start. Awesome.
The kids can go down for Sunday school. The kids want to go for Sunday school. That would be great. Okay, you may be seated. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, again, the email for giving is on your screen. And uh, thank you very much for all of those who have been faithful in giving. It helps us do what we need to do here, so thank you. Uh, I'd encourage you, too, to think about giving to our missions, uh, Canadian Baptist Ministries. And uh, you don't even have to know what missionary or Ukraine or whatever else to give it. If you just give it to them, they're very good at putting it to the right place. So um, on top of your regular giving, if you just put a little message for this much for CBM, that's great as well. And for those of you who missed last week, we do have our coffee fellowship after the service. And uh, what's exciting is uh, I've already heard a few people say, I brought some stuff. <laughs> so, yes. So we can just keep celebrating. The more you bring, the more we celebrate. Of course, we'll need more exercise too, but it'll be fun. So encourage you to do that, and that's great. Um, one exciting thing that's happening is this coming Saturday, uh, March 19th, we are having or hosting a celebration for Afghani New Year's. Uh, their New Year's is March 22nd, right? And they're going to celebrate it on Saturday. So Aziz is trying to organize to have um, a few families. We don't want to overwhelm things too much the first time, but a few families and some of their friends. And I believe there's another uh, group of people that are going to come and help with serving it with Sean Kelly, perhaps. And um, if you need, but if you need to know anything about it, talk to Aziz afterwards. And I would imagine there's a place for a few people to come to meet some of them. Uh, we don't want to overwhelm them, but certainly some of you would be great to join in and become part of this new ministry that we'll be building. Um, I mentioned uh, a few weeks ago that our family that we are uh, sponsoring, they had some hiccups around their medical um, uh, interview. Uh, I talked to the missionaries there this past week, and they said, as far as they know, that's all cleared up. And so now we have two families, one that Aziz is sponsoring and one, this other family that our church is sponsoring, that are both simply waiting for visas and to get over here. So it could be within the next couple months, we could see two families, one family of 11 and one family of five. So that will add some new life in here as well. So, and they will be part of our church. So keep praying for them. Uh, we have a lot of donations so far, but please talk to me if there is something you would like to bring. Uh, we could probably use a few more beds. Um, I'm not sure about anything else. So I'm not going to speak to that, but uh, we'll try to get that figured out. But thank you for your prayers. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, seeing them here soon. Uh, carrying on with prayer time on Wednesdays. Uh, we had a great time of table tennis and men's breakfast this weekend. Uh, family uh, get together is when? 26th is, is the family dinner uh, for families, so please uh, sign up for that if you would like to bring your family. Any other, other announcements, Gabriel? Okay. <laughs> He's got other things whirring in his head, but he hasn't got it all out yet. So, um, yes, lots of things being planned. So, thank you for being part of this. God is doing some good things. And one of that, those great things is um, bringing us people that are new to the church that say, yes, I want to commit myself to this place. And so, um, just before they come up, I just want to share a little bit about membership. Scripture does not anywhere say, you shall be a member. But when we commit to Christ and then acknowledges, acknowledge it publicly, it brings accountability. And it's difficult to believe in Christ and not also believe in his body as well. They kind of go together, the head and the body in a person. So 
Um, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth you confess and are saved. And every aspect of our Christianity is not only about belief in your heart, but it's about expression of that belief. And when it comes to church membership, we're talking about a public acknowledgement of our accountability to Christ that has already begun in four general areas. Accountability to all of us in identifying with Christ. Accountability to all of us in committing to this body, the church, Christ's body. And we hope that all of us who would make that commitment would also carry on that commitment wherever we are in the body of Christ. And then thirdly, committing to all of us and being submissive to the leadership of the church and their shepherding care. And then accountability to all of us and being responsible for the purposes that Christ has, call, Christ has called us to as a body, to go and bear fruit. And so this places just as much responsibility on the rest of us as it does on those who choose to come into membership. And so I want to ask the three people that have, um, we just had a congregational meeting and voted them in, and I'd like, just like you to come to the front, Marjorie and Aziz and Wendy, and uh, any accessory people you want to bring, if you want, it's fine. <laughs> come on up. For those of you who have not met them, one common theme with all three of these people is they have all said, I want to serve, I want to help, I want to be a part of this fellowship. It's an amazing thing. And already our burden is lighter because you are a part of us. Wendy's been helping with Sunday school. Aziz has been helping with our refugees, and he's going to be starting up an in-person Bible study as well. And Marjorie, we know she can sing. So we're looking forward to that, and she's already been helpful downstairs. So thank you already. But in light of your desire to commit yourselves to the membership, do you recognize your responsibility to identify with Christ in his death and resurrection power, to commit yourself to Christ's body, the church, to submit yourself to the shepherding care of the leadership of this local body, and to work toward the purposes for which Christ has called and chosen you. Yes. Yes. All right. That's not the end of it, though. They have said yes, but now it's us. And so I want to ask all of you, will we, as Christ's body, support these new members and their families in their desire to be accountable to these commitments. Amen. Okay, why don't we stand to show our support and let's pray for them as they begin this exciting new journey as part of us. Let's pray. God, we are so excited to have Wendy, Aziz, and Marjorie as part of our church body. You your bride of Christ is that much more beautiful because they are here. And you have called them, you have chosen them, you have gifted them with diverse gifts to make this place a more beautiful place as they serve you. God, we also recognize that this also puts more work on us because our job is now to care for them, to work with them, to make them look good as they make us look good so that your bride is a beautiful thing. And God, we thank you in advance for what they are going to do as you lead them, as your spirit guides them. God, we just thank you for this addition to our family. I pray that you would put a hedge of protection around them and their families so that they can flourish and grow here. Give us the courage to pour into them so that they will become strong in their faith. Give us the courage to be humble so we can listen to them and hear what you are teaching us through them because they have much to offer us. God, I just thank you and we bring all of this to your glory and to your honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And we look forward over the years to hear some of their testimony, what brought them to this place. And uh, thank you.
Let me just stick my hands in the moment. You may, well, stay standing because um, Haram's going to come and lead us and sing some more singing.
may be seated as Henry is going to come and read the scriptures. What a blessing. We don't have to wear the masks anymore. I was talking to Pastor Trevor out the back here, and I was telling him that Sharon and I getting married on June 11th, and so he asked me, well, is there anything I can pray for you with? And I paused for a moment, and I said, well, I've been seeking the Lord for a petition, which is something I do from time to time, especially when the world is going mad and everything's going haywire around us. And I said to Pastor Trevor, the petition that the Lord has given me is, Lord, please wake up your church. Please wake her up. And I want you to come alongside and pray that with me in the days that are ahead. Daily, please. There's a reason for it. Now from Colossians 3, verses 1 to 11. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever things belong to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. The reading of God's word. Well, let's pray together and let's pray what Henry asked us to pray, among other things. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for each person here. Lord, it's such an encouragement to see a family of people that are so willing to serve, to care for each other. And God, I pray that you continue to deepen our friendships with each other and our help for each other, teaching each other encouraging each other and all these things that we need to do with each other. God, I just pray for my own wife with her kidneys that are not doing so well, that you would continue to give her strength. I pray that our church and the church around this world would wake up. Lord, we see so many things going wrong in this world. You are shaking this world. It's not prime ministers or presidents that are shaking this world. Lord, you allow this world to be shaken so that we anchor deeply in you. And not just anchor deeply in you, but use your strength to reach out to tell others of Jesus. Lord, the only reason there is joy in this room is because of your strength, your guidance, your spirit. God, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your grace. Fill us with peace. Fill us with forgiveness. Fill us with encouragement and grace. God, I just thank you that you are among us. I just pray again for those that are not well among us, that are not able to be here. Think of, think of Marilyn, Nandy Fredrickson, for Curtis and Elaine, for Bernie. 
I pray you continue to be with Yvonne Stevenson and Alan Stevenson's family as they grieve her loss. God, I just pray for the many families in Ukraine and Russia that are grieving right now in the loss of life. Oh God, be merciful there. God, we know that you are in control and we ask that you would bring peace soon and that through all of this, many more would turn to you for help. Lord, we are helpless to change world events, but you are firmly in control. And so we bring it all to you. And Lord, as, as we sit here safely in this church, God, give us joy for what we do have. Give us joy for the foundation of Jesus in our lives. Give us the courage to reach out from that place of responsibility because you've given us so much to pass it on to others. God, I just thank you for this opportunity today to worship you. And as we continue to learn from you, I pray that we'd be very much aware of your presence here today. God, we know your spirit is moving. We know your spirit is among us. Build strength into each person here as we humbly rely on you. We are so dependent on you. Go before us as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's been really nice to see the joy and excitement that's building in our church. The last few weeks, I'm sure you've noticed it. People are excited to be with each other, excited to be in the presence of God together. And I pray that we continue to expand that. One of the dangers of getting together and enjoying each other so much is we want to be just here because it's good but we need to bring others into that experience. We need to look at our neighbors, be praying for our friends, our families, and draw them in and say, hey, you gotta see what's happening at North Mount, and bring them in. Well, this last little while, we've been talking about the fact that we are stronger together. Have you ever seen one of those uh, insurance commercials or one of those commercials on TV where something is going drastically wrong 
and then it kind of puts it in slow motion or actually freezes it and they fix it all up and then it's all better as though it never happened, right? Like there's the one commercial where the plant manager comes running out of his office and the water main just broke out on the factory floor and water's spraying everywhere and just about the time his glasses are flying off his face and he scrambles to figure out what to do. They freeze the picture, the professionals move in while everything's frozen, quickly clean up the water, fix up the pipes, and then they unfreeze the picture and put the plant manager's glasses back on and the commercial ends with, like it didn't even happen, right? There is nothing like the feeling of going through something terrible or something messy. And all of a sudden, it's all cleaned up. Last Sunday, we had a big mess downstairs. It was a big relief when it was all done. Cleaned up, finished. It's great. There's a wonderful verse in Romans that talks about how this can actually occur in a church where things are messy among us, things are broken, and Christ comes in and makes it like it never even happened. Listen to Romans chapter 15. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not just to please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. That is, fell on Christ. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may be with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Notice Paul Paul's focus on the example of Christ. He's quoting from the Old Testament. He says, the reproaches of those who approached you fell on me. In other words, they fell on Christ. And so Paul is encouraging us in our work together as a community of a church to have that same example of Christ that the things that going wrong actually are absorbed by Christ. The hurts that come our way to forgive as Christ forgave us. Now for those of you who have been here last little while, been walking through different parts of community and we talked about the meaning of community, we talked about some of these one another things that we do in community. And so we talked over the last couple months about honoring one another, about belonging to one another, and last week we talked about bearing with one another. And today we want to carry on that discussion by talking about forgiving one another. You remember, you may remember in September we were going through this series of talking about fake news. And we, one of them was on forgiveness. And the lie that we often tell ourselves is that forgiveness is conditional. If there's something too bad, I don't have to forgive you. And so we deceive ourselves by all kinds of excuses that, you know, I can't forgive unless the other person apologizes, or they didn't apologize correctly, so their apology is fake. Or, you know, I can forgive almost anything except for, and you name it. Or I just can't go lightly when it's clearly a sin. I just can't treat it that lightly. And I need revenge. But forgiveness is a choice, isn't it? And we talked about the reasons we choose forgiveness. We choose forgiveness because God has forgiven us. We must never forget that one. And Ephesians 4 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. 
And then we forgive because Jesus showed us the way. You know, on the cross, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. It brings healing to your relationships. It strengthens your ministry. And it brings healing to you. I want to go a little bit deeper today because often, in, particularly in our culture, we're very independent when we think about all these different subjects. And forgiveness is really about my experience. But I want to discuss a little bit more today about forgiveness in the context of one another. This mutual forgiveness where I forgive you and you forgive me as a church community. So why is forgiveness so important as a church community? I mean, so many of us, we don't even think about uh, forgiveness in the church community because we kind of show up here on a Sunday morning, we say hi and wave and smile for a few people, and then we're gone. And so we don't think about it too much. But often, there is that one person that we avoid, and we've kind of tucked that in our subconscious. Or there's some situations that we avoid because it hurts too bad. Or maybe outside of this context you've been hurt and that comes in here and it affects the way we deal with each other. So what has forgiving one another got to do with me and our relationship in our community, in our church community? Well, first of all, a very practical thing is that forgiving each other just saves time and energy. When we don't forgive, you know how much extra time that takes on the phone with all the gossip and slander and everything else? Do you know what so-and-so did to me? And we spread it around and it goes on and on and on and on. It just saves a whole lot more time if we forgive and the energy that burdens us down. But forgiveness is more than that. Forgiveness, forgiving each other, actually accomplishes God's given mission for us. Remember Matthew 28, just before Jesus is going up to heaven, he leaves them with this challenge, this command. He says, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I've commanded you. Jesus is saying, your mission is to go out and share the good news. Well, what's the good news? Well, the good news is in Jesus, we've been forgiven. In Jesus, we experience God's grace. He doesn't hold on to all the things that we've done wrong. In Jesus, those things are covered, and we can actually live freely. Amen? And part of God's mission for us to, in this world is to live in that forgiveness and pass it on. So if we are going to be forgiving one another, if we are going to be obedient of Christ, that's got to move out. And that example of forgiveness needs to be part of our mission to everyone we meet. And then forgiving each other is about grace. It's God's grace that created forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And the word that's translated, forgiving each other, one another, it comes out of the Greek word charis, or we often use in English charity, it can come out of that too. But it's the English word of grace. Forgiveness, which tells you that, and in fact, some translations actually Use, you know, be gracious to one another instead of forgiving one another. So you can see that grace and forgiveness go hand in hand. They're two sides of the same thing. And the people you see that appear to be the most gracious people are people that are committed to forgiveness before you even open your mouth. Think about that. In other words, before a negative word is even comes out of my mouth, before my brokenness fails and falls all over them, they have already made a commitment to treat me with forgiveness, to treat me with grace, 
to cover over that moment that I'm spewing out something bad, and they cover it with grace. And the matter disappears much more quickly. Even the way it's worded, forgiving one another, Paul is telling us it's an ongoing thing, which brings me to the next point. That forgiving each other is a daily exercise. It doesn't just happen on that one moment when we get together and somebody offends you. It's a daily exercise that we need to practice. You know, over the last few weeks, we walked through some videos on the Lord's Prayer. And we looked at the Lord's Prayer. And the underlying assumption of the Lord's Prayer, it's a daily practice. When the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. He, they weren't saying, could you just teach me one formula that I can use once in a while? No. This was a daily thing. God, how do we practice? Jesus, how do we practice this thing called prayer? Well. And Jesus in that says, Father, give us our daily bread. In other words, we ask this daily and you need to add that to all the other expressions in, the, in that prayer. Forgive us daily our trespasses as we forgive daily those who trespass against us. We read earlier in Romans 15, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not just to please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, for his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, for it is written, the reproaches of those who approach you fell on me. And listen carefully. The only way for a church family to be described in this way is if there are a whole lot of us practicing what Jesus taught us. To make it a habit of breathing forgiveness constantly instead of a commitment to relating to others in an ungodly fashion, we do whatever is necessary, as long as necessary, to bring that grace to our group. And that's going to take all of us. Can you imagine if there was just one or two people in our group that were super forgiving? Well, they would be working overtime trying to put out fires, wouldn't they? But if we are all being forgiving, that just lightens all of our load, doesn't it? And then forgiving each other means being alert. Listen to the words of Jesus in Luke 17. Jesus says to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. In other words, there's going to be things every day that are going to inevitably come that you've got to forgive. Right? Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown in the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. That's how serious sin is. But then he says, so watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent. You must forgive them. You must forgive them. And the disciples are thinking, oh my goodness. God, help my faith. Right? Increase our faith. We all need help, don't we, in this? Because there are certain things that hurt us, that push our buttons. And we have a hard time forgiving those things. And we need Christ's strength in us to do this well. And so Jesus says, watch yourselves. Be alert. If we are going to forgive one another, we've got to be alert. In other words, because we all mess up, expect it. Be watchful for it. Be on guard on how you're going to react to it. Instead of when you come on Sunday morning and somebody says, you know, you're, I don't really like you. I mean, they're not going to say that in those words. But something happens and you feel offended. That offense is often because you didn't come prepared. 
I want to ask you, when you got up this morning, did you start your day by praying and saying, God, I need my shield up. I need to put my guard up. I need to be careful. God, help me to be ready to practice forgiveness wherever I go. Notice that Jesus in this passage starts with an offense that happens. He just assumes offenses are going to happen. Every day we need to assume that somebody's going to say something, do something that's going to hurt us. Because we're in a broken world. Don't ever be deceived into thinking, you know, if I just had my perfect soulmate, things would be wonderful. Right? If I could just have that long flowing hair or somebody with big muscles. Well, I got news for you. The next morning, some of that flowing hair is in the sink and it's bugging you. And the next morning, the socks don't get picked up by the bulging muscles. When reality hits, there needs to be forgiveness. So we need to be proactive. And notice that our alertness can often lead to rebuke because love sometimes has to discipline. We need to challenge and not run away from faults. Again, we rebuke though, even the word rebuke has the tone of it as tentatively, graciously. Speak the truth, how? In love, right? Because we may not have all the facts straight. We don't know what they're going through. But when a sin is recognized, immediately our breathing should react with forgiveness. Ken Sandy, he's written some books on peacemaking. And he summarizes four promises that Christians must make in order to forgive one another. First of all, I will not dwell on this incident. Secondly, I will not bring up this incident again and use it against you. Third, I will not talk to others about this incident. And fourth, I will not let this incident stand between us or hinder our personal relationship going forward. And he writes later, by making and keeping these promises, you can tear down the walls that stand between you and your offender. Your prom you promise not to dwell on or brood over the problem or to punish by holding the person at a distance. You clear the way for your relationship to develop unhindered by memories of past doing. And that's exactly what God does for us, isn't it? He has made this commitment to us. To not hold those offenses against us in Christ. You know, there's one thing that gives me hope in this war in Ukraine. There's only one key thing. When you see a story of Ukrainian feeding a Russian and caring for them, or vice versa, that takes huge amounts of forgiveness. But it's the only way to solve the issues, is to come, bring forgiveness into a difficult, difficult context where hurt will happen. But we need Jesus for forgiveness. See, one of the problems with um, forgiveness is that it's very costly. It's very costly. But forgiveness brings power. Forgiving each other brings power. See, what differentiates a Christian home, a Christian church, from other community things and other groups is not that we don't sin. It's what happens when sin happens. It's the forgiveness that overpowers that bad situation and resolves it, and God gets the glory. Many of the problems we face in society is simply because of lack of forgiveness. Gangs, suicide, divorce, much of it happens because of a lack of forgiveness. 
This is radical in a culture that says, if you hurt me first, it's done. Forgiveness is not an option. And Jesus says, I can give you the strength to make it an option, even when it seems impossible. And oftentimes, our culture has influenced us. See, Christians from a very individualistic, independent kind of culture, we like the biblical emphasis on affirming each other's and sharing each other's hurts and problems, but we hate the idea of accountability and discipline, which is what church should be about. Some more traditional communal cultures, they love the, they love the emphasis on accountability for morals and beliefs, but they often chafe at the emphasis on reconciliation between different groups and being open about one's personal hurts and financial needs. But one could look at the scriptures as so radical that there is no culture on this earth that teaches both forgiveness and reconciliation so radically in one group. Bonhoeffer said this, our community with one another in Christ consists solely in what Christ has done to both of us. Christian brotherhood is a spiritual and not a human reality. In this it differs from all other communities. And if we at Northmount are truly going to become a healthy Christian community, it means a commitment to never, ever give up on one another. It means that we as a community never give up on any relationship in this building and beyond. It means a commitment to never write off another believer or another human being. We never must tire of forgiving and seeking to repair relationships. In fact, Matthew says, if you even know of somebody that you have something against, go to them, drop everything else and go to them. Talk to them. Matthew 18 says, if somebody sins against you, you need to talk to them. In other words, if any relationship has cooled off, it's getting weaker, it's always your move. Think about that. It doesn't matter who started it. God always holds us responsible to reach out and repair a tattered relationship. Why? Because we have the strength of Jesus Christ, the God of the universe who perfected per forgiveness, living in us. God gives us the strength to be the initiator. And forgiveness means giving up the right to seek repayment from one who's harmed you. See, forgiveness really is a form of voluntary suffering. In other words, let's say a friend breaks my lamp in my house. The lights go out. I know that that lamp costs 50 bucks, okay, to replace it. So, this breaking of the lamp incurs a debt of $50. If I let him pay for it and replace the lamp, I get my lamp back and he's out 50 bucks, right? But if I forgive him that, for what he did, that debt does not vanish into thin air. When I forgive him, I am absorbing that debt the cost and the payment for the lamp, or if I decide not to get another one, I absorb the sacrifice of living in darkness, whatever, right? But forgiving is to cancel the debt by paying for it or absorbing it yourself. Someone always pays every debt. That's the case in every kind of wrongdoing, whether money is involved or not. In every case of wrongdoing, there is a debt. And there's no way to deal with it without some kind of suffering. 
And God incurred this incredible brokenness. There was a huge debt because of our sin. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to absorb that debt. I'm going to pay for it so that you don't have to. That cost Jesus his life. It cost him everything, but he was willing to pay for it for us. Because forgiveness is always extremely costly. It's emotionally very expensive. It takes blood, sweat, and tears sometimes. So often, forgiveness is granted before it's even felt. Jesus died before we even had done all our sinning. But he said, I'm going to pay for it ahead of time anyways. Because he took a stance of forgiveness. It's difficult. It's painful. But we are walking in the path of our master, are we not? And the gospel gives us two prerequisites for a life of forgiveness. Emotional humility and emotional wealth. You can remain bitter towards somebody only if you feel superior to them. Kind of like, I would never have done that, right? With that superiority, you don't forgive. We need humility that says, except for the grace of God, there go I, right? When Paul says he is the worst of, sin of sinners, he isn't exaggerating. In his humility, he says, except for the grace of God, I am the worst out there. I could be a murderer. I could be doing all kinds of terrible things without Christ. Humility puts us in a place where it's easier to forgive because of what Christ has done. So the gospel equips us with this emotional humility. At the same time, you can't be gracious to someone if you're too needy and insecure. If you know God's love and forgiveness then, it frees you, it gives you this wealth of forgiveness because there's no limit regardless of the hurt you've experienced because of what Christ has done for you. Your real identity is found in Jesus. And out of that comes this wealth of forgiveness. And the more you rejoice in your own forgiveness, take the time today to thank God for what you've received in Christ's forgiveness. Because that will propel you to have the wealth to help others. And forgiveness flounders when I exclude my enemy from the community of humans. Even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. Think about that. Let me say that again. Forgiveness flounders when I exclude the enemy from the community of humans. Even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. But no one can be in the presence of of the God of the crucified Messiah for long without overcoming that double exclusion. Because Jesus draws us to other people in forgiveness. Tim Keller says, when you try to get payment through revenge, the evil doesn't disappear. Instead, it spreads. And it sp spreads most tragically of all onto you and your own character. Margaret Stunt says, forgiveness is liking, like drinking deadly poison and hoping the other person dies. Tertullian, many centuries ago, said, you want to be happy for a while? Revenge. You want to be happy forever? Forgive. If you haven't learned to forgive, we haven't learned how to be a Christian community. Let me just leave you this one little saying. Forgive your enemies. It'll mess with their heads. And it might even give you an opportunity to talk about Jesus when they're bewildered. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for teaching us this morning. And God, give us the courage as we walk out of here to make it a habit of breathing forgiveness. To be alert so that we practice forgiving attitude before we even talk to people. Because we know inevitably we will be hurt today and tomorrow and the next day. Give us the courage to live in the strength of the forgiveness of Jesus. Thank you for each person here. 
Thank you for the forgiveness and grace I have been shown by many in this house. God, go before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's, let's stand together. may want to try something really brave and after the service look somebody in the eyes and tell them that <laughs> I love you with the love of the Lord we have a great God who gives us the strength to do that I encourage you to stick around and uh, let's share our coffee time together and now Lord I thank you for the power of forgiveness and I choose to forgive everyone who's hurt me help me be free to release these people to you. Help me bless those who've hurt me. Help me walk in righteousness, peace, and joy, demonstrating your life here on earth. I choose to be kind and compassionate, forgiving others, just as you forgave me in Jesus. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated.